Ancient standing stones are far from a rarity in Britain, Ireland, and Gaul. Many of these stones are of a Neolithic origin, but others are from the early Bronze Age, and indeed at times they are not easily dated. Some of them were formed into circles or henges, but others were freestanding, singular stones, called menhir. Among these are a more rare type of singular standing stones, with a hole through them. These stones from France, Gaul, Ireland, Britain, and elsewhere are often related to the same type of ancient practice recorded as continuing into the early modern period. In Orkney, a stone such as this was linked to the Norse god Odin. What are these mysterious stones, and what connection do they have to the Norse king of the gods. Hi friends, I'm Kevin McLean. Don't forget to hit the like button, subscribe, and consider supporting me through Patreon or PayPal. Check the links below. Of all the many hold standing stones in Ireland, Britain, Gaul, and elsewhere, they are generally all associated with healing, magic, and marriage. The stones that focus on healing generally have larger holes through which the person, often an infant, passes through in order to receive healing. Perhaps a passing through the stone is akin to a symbolic rebirth, the Menantol of Cornwall is an example of this type. The name in Cornish means simply the whole stone. Children were passed through it to heal from diseases. Old men crawled through it to help with pain in the back. However, more commonly, the holes in these stones were not so large. Sometimes an infant could fit through them, but generally not an adult. And so, Items of clothing and other apparel was passed through the hole, and once passed through, they could convey the magical healing properties to the wearer. Now, the other main association with these stones is in relation to oaths and the practice of a type of hand fasting. A vow to marry, or the marriage itself, was conducted by a man and a woman standing on opposite sides of the stone. Generally, the woman would pass her arm through the stone, and the man would take hold of her hand. But in certain places, the practice was slightly modified, and might have involved an object, or even kissing through the hole. In some places, there was a custom of drawing clothing or personal objects through the hole, conveying a blessing upon the person who wore it. The Klochna Norm was said to have been the stone through which the golden armband of kings Khan, Cormac, and Carbre was drawn, giving them excellent rule. The origin of the holes in these stones is somewhat of a mystery, but some of them appear to have been natural, while others may have been manufactured by hand. But in all cases, they were seen as a type of gateway into an other world. Many of the stones were destroyed by Christians or covered with Christian symbology, likely with the purpose of trying to either claim its power for the Christian god or to drive out a demon. The Laura Gavala Erin states that since the coming of Christ the stone has lost its power since the demon was driven from it. There it is speaking of the famous Leah Fall a stone linked to Lug and the Declaration of Kings of Ireland. It was after touching the stone that the High King Khan was brought by Lug into his otherworldly abode and served a drink by the goddess of Severnity, his daughter, while he enumerated all the kings to come. One version of the Laurigavala specifically calls the Leofal Lug's stone. The Odin Stone of Orkney no longer exists. It wasn't destroyed by religious zealots, but by a greedy farmer 
1814, irritated that people kept walking on his property to see it. But we know much about it from the local folklore, where the stone had an important place. Apparently, there were attempts to burn down his house afterwards by angry residents. He had intended to do even more damage to the sacred landscape. He destroyed one of the standing stones of Stenes and felled another and would have destroyed the entire site had the government not stepped in and ordered him to stop at the instigation of a local historian. Like many of the other hold stones, the Odin stone also had healing properties. Limbs, heads, and items were passed through the hole to bless them, and simple offerings were also left at the stone. It was the source of magic associated with the number nine. Nine times a man circled it on his knees for nine moons and looked through it nine times so that he would be able to see Hildaland, the hidden abode of the Finn folk something akin to the Shire, but who dwelt beneath the sea. But the most famous aspect of the stone was oath-swearing. Though most famous for the marriage akin to hand-fasting, other oaths of more important magnitude were also sworn by it in the same manner. These were considered unbreakable, and great misfortune or even death would follow any transgressor. It was taken so seriously by the community that people known to have broken the oath were cast out. These oaths were, even as late as 1792, ascribed to the god Odin. An ancient ballad from Orkney also references this, saying that men swore by the one who hung on the tree to marry her that he won his wife by Odin's oath. A tale of an Orkney pirate John Go also relates how powerful this oath was. When he'd sworn himself to marry, he was captured and executed in London. His wife-to-be traveled all the way to touch the hand of the corpse to be released of the oath, or so the story goes. But these stories of oaths and hand fastings associated with the stone at Orkney although clearly associated with Odin by Orcadians, is not a feature of any myth or practice of Norse origin. But it is identical to practices associated with stones like it in Ireland and in Gaul, and thus the practice is very likely to be of a Celtic origin. Odin, then, is the name of the Norse god that was interpreted by the Norse settlers and the locals to be most equivalent to an earlier Celtic god associated with the stone. It is a rare but clear example of a Norse interpretation of a Celtic god, and we can actually prove exactly what god that was. Not too far from Cork, Ireland, stands the Cahirlach. The stone is also associated with healing in the same manner as the others and likewise the tradition of marriage. Couples would marry or vow to marry by grabbing each other's hands through the stone. Across the sea and a thousand miles to the south, not far from the French town of Drache, there is a stone called the Pierre Pierce, the pierced stone. Marriages were made through joining hands through it or passing a bouquet or exchanging a kiss through the opening. The stone likewise has the power to ward off evil spirits, and grasses growing around it were used for protection. But it was not only the oaths of marriage initially which the stone governed. It was said that the oaths of warring tribes would make a pact by touching fingers through the hole. But there are darker myths, too, of human sacrifice by the druids with victims tied upright to the stone. Interesting is that some of the stones such as this in Ireland are likewise associated with chaining a figure to it, and it may have a common genuine origin. 
Lug was said to possess a chain that tied the prisoners of the Milesians and the Tuatha and a story of Neil of the Nine Hostages has him confront a prisoner bound by just such a stone who breaks free and kills him. And in this particular case, the stone is actually linked to a grave site. Some speculate that the hole was to pass food through for the dead, but it may have also been thought that the spirit could escape through the hole. 1,000 kilometers to the east, in Germany, stands the Menhir of Gerbstedt. Originally, the stone stood to the south of its present location and may have been part of a cist-style grave. The stone has a medieval legend associated with it. It was said that before the Battle of Wefischholz, Count Hoyer von Mansfeld swore a great oath upon the stone. A thunderstorm softened the rock, and he passed his hand right through it, saying, As sure as I can reach into the stone, this battle must also be mine. Again, associating the whole stone with a great oath, likely a reformulation of a much earlier tale. A thousand miles to the northwest, near New Galloway, Scotland, a now broken stone stands, said to have been the site of the same type of marriage ceremonies. And across Ireland and Britain there are many other examples of such stones which haven't been mentioned. But now we look a bit to the south, to the West Midlands, the town of Wolverhampton. This stone is the second key to unlock the mystery, for where the Stone of Orkney was linked to Odin, there is good reason to believe the Deal Stone or the Bargain Stone of Wolverhampton was linked to Anglo-Saxon Woden. Standing at St. Peter's Church is a strange stone with a hole through it. Some believe it is a broken piece of a gargoyle statue, but the custom surrounding the stone speaks to something far more archaic. When trades were made, especially of large amounts of sheep or wool, deals would be solidified by a handshake through the hole of the stone. Though associated with commercial practice in this case, the function of the stone solidifying a bond of oath remains identical. Either the stone is not, in fact, a gargoyle, or an earlier local myth has been ascribed to a gargoyle fragment after the original stone went missing or was destroyed. But we know for certain that there was an early Anglo-Saxon settlement in the area of Wolverhampton based on place names. Forming part of Wolverhampton is a place called Wensfield, a name originating as Wodensfield. This name must be of Anglo-Saxon pre-Christian origin and speaks to early settlement at the site prior to conversion. It was here, on the 5th of August, 910, that the Allied forces of Mercia and Wessex defeated an army of Northumbrian Vikings. A fitting place for the defeat, and a fitting time, as we shall see. One of the earliest details of the town we find in medieval sources is dated to 1179. By 1204, King John learned that the market of Wolverhampton was not chartered, but the town obtained a royal charter for a weekly market by 1258, and guess which day the market chartered for? Woden's Day. Likely, as it was the day they had always held the market, matching the day of the god of local prominence, and matching the stone that oversaw the O's of exchange between people at this market. In the medieval period, the town became a hub for the wool trade, with product coming in from Wales, and such large transactions were associated with the stone, whether or not it was the stone that today stands at St. Peter's Church is up for debate, but the idea that such took place is indisputable. All of the stones we have looked at so far are associated first and foremost with oaths, and secondly with magic in general, especially healing, always of a beneficent type. In Ireland, this custom of marriage proposal was associated with the time of Lunasa, 
and played a part often in local Lunasa fairs. Though the dating associated with the custom is different in different regions, the custom is always the same and speaks to what could only have been a common origin, almost certainly Celtic. Though associated with Odin and Woden, there is little evidence I could find for a similar custom in Norse myth or folklore, but if someone knows one, please leave it in the comments below. However, it is possible to see a similar idea with the ring, either a ring upon the finger or an armband, sometimes perhaps referred to as an oath ring. The same symbolism of binding, of putting one's finger or arm through a ring or a circle is still present in both putting it through the hole in the stone or putting it through the hole of the ring. The final key to the Odin stone mystery lies in the land of the Kamri, the Sech Ronu, the stone of Gronu, is another whole stone which stands along the Avon Bryn Saith in Blanae Festiniog in Gwynedd, and this stone has a very famous story straight from the Welsh legend of the Mabinogi. It is unknown if this modern stone corresponds exactly to the legendary one, but in either case it preserves the same elements. The story goes as this. Lle, the son of Arenrod, had a wife made of flowers. When he was away for a time, she betrayed him and took a lover named Gronu Peber. They crafted a plan to murder Lle, who is otherwise invincible. Due to the wiles of Blodaiwith, the method is learned, and after an elaborate setup, Lle is speared in the back. He takes to the form of an eagle and flies away. His uncle Gwydion finds him perched atop a tree in Nantse, but clearly the location is described and intended as an otherworld location parallel to the physical one. He calls Se down from the tree and turns him back to human form. Then the two join forces to seek revenge. While Gwydion changes Blodaiwith into an owl and her handmaidens drown in a lake, Se confronts Gronu. He vows to return the strike against him. Pleading and blaming Blodaiwith, Gronu asks for one of his men to take the blow for him, but they all refuse and become known as the cowardly retinue of Britain. Next, he appeals to Se to allow him to put a stone between himself and the spear. Se agrees to this, then makes the cast. The spear cuts straight through the stone and kills Gronu, who is cowering behind it, fulfilling the revenge and leaving a spear shaft sized hole in the stone. On the surface, the story may not seem directly related to the cult function, but it is. The strike through the stone is made in revenge for the violation of the marriage bond, the oath made through that same hole, commits one fully, knowing that to violate the oath will result in the same deadly fate. The tale provides the mythical origin of such holes and why they are always connected with oaths and with marriage in particular. Lug, or Se, is thought to mean the one of the oath from Proto-Celtic Lugu, meaning oath. Surviving Norse myth does not provide a similar tale or explanation as to why Odin would be connected with the Stone of Orkney, and the most likely case is that the Norse, and perhaps even the English of Wodensfield, interpreted the Celtic god Lug as Odin or Woden. And this, by extension, tells us something about Odin, not clearly preserved in Norse myth, that he must have been associated with the binding power of the oath in the same way as Lug, and it's very likely that in origin these gods were one and the same, and the story of Thay's death and rebirth from the tree certainly seems akin to Odin upon the Yggdrasil, as does the spear wielded by both, an association with wolves, with one-eyedness, and likely with some commercial function as well partly explaining the Roman link to Mercury as a god who oversaw the exchange 
and enforce the contracts made between commercial parties, buyer and seller. This binding element is also linked to Thay's shoe stitching and the chain of Lug said to bind prisoners of the Milesians and the Tuadei, making Lug also the god of prisoners, akin to a name for Odin. The binding element is also present in the noose associated with Odin. The hanging man's neck is bound by a rope. Odin is a son of Bestla, a name likely derived from Best, the inner bark of a tree used primarily and associated with the making of rope. Lug is the son of Ethu, meaning seed, but her true name is given as Feada, a tree or wood, and he is associated with a treaty between the gods and giants, and in folklore with a contract between Kian and Balor. Further, Lunasa is likely derived originally from the verb Naska, meaning to bind, so that the meaning in origin was Lug's binding, here referring to his wedding with the earth. The Odin Stone and its association with oaths and marriage from Ireland to Germany is solid archaeological evidence that connects the god to his Celtic counterpart Lug. The key which unlocked this Germanic Norse link will help us better understand the gods and mythology of both. Well, I hope you liked the video, and if you did, please like, subscribe, and consider supporting me through Patreon or PayPal. I'd like to thank all of my supporters, and as always, stand tall.